Well, everybody, thanks and welcome to the Ace Cafe. Can I hear a little hey? Yeah. All right, that's what I want to hear. All right, welcome to the Ace Cafe. It's Porsche night, and we have somebody that's going to be our host for Porsche. His name is Brian Cheney. He told me to say that he's a Porsche enthusiast. I don't know why he wants me to say that. He said in about 1980, if I get this right, he was working with the IMSA race group and he was racing cars and I met, <laughs> he'll tell you this story, but I met him by accident through my son and he's probably sorry that he did. Brian, come on out. All right, so we want to, as I said, switch gears and talk a little bit about um, pretty interesting topic, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot going on uh, in the Porsche world these days and you know, the last time we had you on the show, Last month, uh, we talked about you know the the four cylinder, the evolution of the four cylinder car from the 356 out to the 718. Uh, so you gave us some insight about that, um, you know. But really, what we want to talk about uh, today is this is this whole idea of where where Porsche is going with electric technology. Uh, you know, Porsche of Orlando was really nice today to bring down um, the Porsche e-hybrid Cayenne. It's a platinum edition, actually. So it's a very special edition of the, of the Cayenne e-hybrid. So we have it here with us tonight. And we just want to talk about this a little bit and, and get into the conversation. Uh, because I think that it's like the Porsche purists, whatever that means. Um, you know, the, the folks that, you know, everything's got to be original. Or everything's got to be a manual shifter or it's not a Porsche all these kinds of conversations that we hear uh, that I, I sort of sense it's the same thing this time around with electric you know that not everyone is super excited about what's going on with electric and they're not really talking about it so I want to just dive into that a little bit tonight and uh, and talk about it um, you know we talked last time about Porsche the first Porsche car actually or the por the first car that dr. Ferdinand Porsche designed not actually the road car by the name but a, the first car that he designed was an electric car. This is back in 1898. Uh, today, arguably, um, you know, the fastest Porsche racing car that's ever been built, and we can talk a little bit about that. I know we talked about this the other night, whether that was really the truth or not, but you can argue that the, the 919 hybrid today, uh, the 919 prototype Le Mans car, um, you know, is the fastest Porsche racing car ever. You know, a zero to 60 time of two seconds, a zero to 120 and a little over four seconds. You know, just a blazingly fast car, and we're talking about an e-hybrid car. Um, you can also, I think it's pretty clear, and you can correct me on this one, but the fastest street car, in fact, is a 918 Spider. Um, again, a, a two second, uh, two and a half second, zero to 60, and about a seven second, zero to 120 car. So you can't deny that Porsche is involved with electric. They see it as something that's very important for the brand, right? So that's why I thought it would be a good topic to, sure. to, to talk about and really give people a little bit of an education about um, about e-hybrid and electric and and even the recently announced Mission E, totally electric sports car from Porsche. So let's go ahead and open up the conversation. You're more of the uh, more of the authority or more knowledgeable about electric than I am. I've been doing my homework and trying to learn a little bit along the way. But what can you tell us about uh, Porsche's e-hybrid technology and sort of the technology? that we we see next to us here in the Cayenne. Well, Brian, uh, first thing is every Porsche will always be a sports car. So it doesn't matter if it's an SUV, it doesn't matter if it's a sedan, it doesn't matter what it is, it's always going to be a sports car. That's They they put that out there, they're very clear on their mission. Um, they're, it's, it's the future, that's what's happening, whether we like it or not. And as car enthusiasts, there's lots of pushback, there's lots of pushback with double clutch transmissions, there's pushback with all types of technology, but a Porsche will always be a Porsche for the times. But I've always said, people like to complain about the 911. Oh, the 911 isn't what it used to be. Of course it's not, because that was then. You can still buy that car, go buy it. It's pre-owned, buy it, enjoy it. If you want the 911 of today, it has to be competitive. They're an engineering company first. They've always been ahead of the game. They've always been the leaders of technology. And that goes for all of the cars, whether it's a race car, a street car, or whatever. They love technology. They always have. 
So with hybrid, it's no surprise that of course they've gotten into hybrid. Um, you know, global demands are huge nowadays, and a lot of people think, well, why does Porsche do this? Why does Porsche do that? I don't understand. You know, the enthusiast, blah, blah, blah. I'm an enthusiast. I'm a hardcore enthusiast. If they can all be air-cooled, uh, you know, 2,000 pounds, that would make me happy. But we have to be realistic. So the beautiful thing is Porsche is here to stay. They're not going anywhere, and they are doing it in with new hybrid technology. I think we'll see a new 911 hybrid pretty soon. Rumors would suggest so. Uh, but the hybrid they've been making, the Cayenne hybrid now, the Panamera hybrid for a few years, this isn't the latest that's coming out, so that technology has grown. Um, I did get an opportunity to drive the new Panamera hybrid. The first one, I was like, okay, well this is a Porsche for somebody who wants to buy a hybrid car. Not a strong statement for what we generally build, but for a hybrid car, it is an opportunity for someone who thinks they're just buying something to save gas, save the environment, whatever, and actually be able to have a good time. Wow, what a concept. The new one pretty much just erases any thoughts you, you would have had of, you know, is this a sports car? Oh, it's a sports car. It's a tiny bit heavier, but it's a sports car. Um, the 919 um, race car, which we can argue back and forth what was the fastest. I think you you were involved in, was it 962s? Yes. Yes. Uh, 962s, pretty, pretty darn fast. But regardless, the 919 3 feet in Le Mans, I mean, who wins Le Mans? Who wins Le Mans three times in a row? Who does it with a four-cylinder turbo hybrid? Of course it is. That's why they're the best, but I'm very biased. But anyway, um, I think the biggest thing we have coming and probably, arguably most exciting would be the Mission E. Mission E is Porsche's dive into a full electric car. Uh, we've seen lots of spy photos, we've seen lots of information online. The latest rumors would suggest a 400, 500, and 600 something horsepower car. You hear a lot of people, believe it or not, and a lot of the younger generation would come into the dealership and say, oh wow, that's a really cool car, but did you see the new Tesla? And it took me months and months and months to figure out, like, why is anybody even talking about the Tesla? It's the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Once again, I'm biased. Porsche is making an electric car. It will go up against the Tesla. And unlike the Tesla, it will be a real sports car. It will have their DNA, as it always has in the past. What is a real sports car? Drive a Porsche and find out. That's the simplest way to put it. So, so when we, so for folks that you know really don't understand, okay, we say hybrid. What is that? You know. So, you know, here's what I know about the hybrid technologies. So you can fill in the blanks uh, for you. But basically, what we're looking at, for example, here in the Cayenne E Hybrid, is a three-liter V6. Um, supercharged motor, so this is a, an internal combustion engine, you know, that we're all familiar with. But then you throw on top of it uh, electric motors that now bump the horsepower in that three-liter supercharge from around 330 horsepower up to almost 420 horsepower when you add in the electric uh, piece of it. So now that electric piece uh, allows this car to have a lot more torque, a lot more acceleration right out of the gate. Um, so this is really sort of the first part of electric. And now we're starting to see more manufacturers go into the fully electric cars as Tesla has and then uh, as Porsche has announced. I was reading yesterday that Ford Motor Company has just announced a doubling down in electric. So we talk about electric, you know, it's coming. It, we're going to see more electric cars here in the next three or four or five years than our wildest imagination. But I heard yesterday that Ford has committed $22, million, $22 billion into the development of their electric cars. This is a change, this is a doubling of their investment from just six months ago when they were talking about this. So, you know, it's not only Porsche, it's not only Tesla, it's Ford, it's Nissan, it's Renault, it's everybody out there that are that are getting involved in electric. You know, Porsche has stepped away from the prototype racing of the 919 with all the success that they've had, right? Three consecutive 24-hour Le Mans wins, three consecutive uh, World Endurance Championship, um, you know, trophies on their mantle, and they're stepping away from that 
and entering into the Formula E series, which is Formula cars, you know, the, the Formula One Indy style car, electric racing. You know, so that's a big statement. You know, why Porsche is doing that? They're going to continue to race their 911. Um, you know, it's as iconic as ever. They're not going to pull back from regular sports car racing. In fact, in two weeks, uh, they're going to be racing those 911 RSRs right up in the 24 hours of, uh, in the Rolex 24, right up the street here in two weeks. So all that's going to continue. But what they're doing with electric is really pretty amazing. So when we, when we talk about hybrid, you know, that's really what it is, the combination of an internal combustion engine with these electric motors to make them, you know, something that's just kind of, kind of crazy. So what can you tell us maybe a little bit more about um, that mission? Yeah, I know you mentioned horsepower ratings, but anything else you can tell us about about that car and really what, what Porsche is thinking about with that. So, Brian, they're really applying the same principles that they always have in the past. Um, you know, it's going to be, uh, you, generally with a Porsche, you can expect lighter weight than competitors. You can expect more braking than it would ever need and more suspension than it would ever need. Um, I think what a lot of people don't know, um, Tesla, not to bring them up again, but they've really, uh, it's funny how many people think that is a sports car. Now, everybody has a different definition of what a sports car is, but if you can't take a car to do one lap of any track in the U.S. without breaking down, that's not a sports car. I'm sorry, that's not a sports car. <laughs> if it's just a one, you know, down the road, fast thing, you know, 0 to 60, blah, 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 quarter mile, great. Uh, that's fun, that's exciting. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Disney World's fun too, that's right up the street also. Um, you know, what Porsche is going to do for the electric car, and me personally, is the first time I've ever been excited about an electric car, is they promise it will do, run the Nurburgring in under eight minutes. It will um, evoke emotion. You know, you can talk about numbers, you can talk about times, and the biggest thing is what that feeling is going to feel like. Um, you know, I, you drive a 200 horsepower Porsche, it feels special on the right roads. You drive a Tesla through the mountains of Utah, it feels like a total disaster. Ask me how I know. Um, you know, but uh, to each their own, I guess you could say. But so they're they're really, really, really um, aware of what that Porsche feel is, and I think personally. You won't get that same car that you're used to, but you will get that same car that you're used to. It's a hard thing to pull off. Take take a combustion engine out of a car, replace it with an electric motor. Sacrilege, you know. But you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You'll have car enthusiasts. It'll be it'll be fun. It'll arguably be better. Better is a relative term. We can argue about that all day too. So. Um, really exciting with their technology. Um, they always under promise over deliver. Um, you're looking at a 75% charge in less than 20 minutes. So if you're going to Miami and you were to take a competitor car, I'm not going to mention the name again, I've said it enough. Um, you know, you got 30 minutes to an hour to get a charge to go where you're going. I mean, that's kind of frustrating. Glad that somebody was able to make a successful car in that room, but Porsche is going to take it to the next level. So. Well, that's, that's awesome to hear. You know, that, that I think that's the big thing that everyone wonders about electric cars. It's like, you know, how are they going to solve this charging problem? How are they going to solve the battery problems? You know, is this really going to make it? Uh, electric is definitely here. It, it is going to make it. At what level is yet to be determined? But when you have the likes of Porsche and all these other folks, Ford Motor Company and everyone else, you know, putting billions and billions of dollars in, you know that we're upon really, um, I think I said this to you the other night when we were speaking that in my lifetime I have never seen or heard of anything like this in the automotive industry this is going to be a time that we're all going to you know we're going to be taken back uh, the advances that are going to take place in the next two three four five years I think are going to be just mind-blowing you know everything today happens at a much quicker pace uh, and you know ele electric cars electrifying cars hybrid electric whatever whatever it may be that's what's going to happen so all right, well, I really appreciate you coming in and speaking to us tonight about the, the e-hybrid. I always look forward to speaking to you, and you always have uh, some insightful uh, comments about it. Uh, so, again, thanks for coming in so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah.
pleasure. Right. And our next guest, his name is Ron Zitza with Zotz Racing. So we're going to call him in here in just a minute, but I think you're going to find some pretty interesting stories coming from Ron about his passion from Porsche. So come on in, Ron, and join us. Great. Oh, that's, uh, we're going to kick my phone out of the side that popped out of my pocket and just get into the conversation. So, um, you know, we're, we're on our fourth edition of Porsche Night here at Ace Cafe. I know it's your first night here at Ace Cafe. So have you had a chance to walk around and take a look at the place a little bit? I have. I was um, pleasantly surprised. There's quite a lot here. Some of these the bikes here are fabulous. And, of course, the Porsche's out front and this one inside. Very Nice. All right, so did you get a chance to go upstairs by any chance? Did you walk through any of the museum areas and see any of the stuff up there? No, after uh, our little soiree here, I'm going to go upstairs, look at the bikes, and then have something to eat. All right. Well, great. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that because you're going to see some, uh, some neat uh, art, some neat uh, artwork on Porsche down the hall, and you're going to see some pretty neat mosaics of uh, the Porsche brand upstairs. So pretty cool stuff up there, too. So we're going to go ahead and dive into the conversation with you. You. And I think it's really pretty interesting. When you think about people in Porsche in Central Florida, we had a guest on uh, a few shows ago, Nort Northam, and you know he has uh, quite a lot of history here in Central Florida with Porsche. And I thought it was just perfect to have you next on because it sort of takes it uh, to a little different perspective. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And I know we talked earlier about your Porsche passion, sort of sort of how you started. So maybe you can just tell everybody uh, a little bit about that. Well, I don't know that I had much of a choice uh, growing up. It was going to the shop with my dad. Uh, that started at a very young age. Going to the racetrack started about two. And uh, now I'm well beyond two and it's all been at the racetrack and uh, we love it. So for me, I'm very comfortable at the racetrack, having been there my entire life. And and um, I look forward to doing more and more of it. And Porsche is such a great automobile, and people have so much fun with them, both as a street car and a track car. It's just rewarding, not just buying it and sitting in it and enjoying it around, but going on the track and seeing how well they perform. Okay? So for me, having started very young, watching my dad, at one point, of course, he was one of my hero drivers. He was very smooth, driving 356 Porsches in the Sports Car Club of America, and uh, he was just a fabulous driver. I always wanted to be a good driver, and then when people told me I was, I was like, uh, okay, if you say so. And of course, I've had a number of accomplishments that I'm very pleased with over the years, and been able to run a lot of professional racing, and and I, I, I think I've, I've really had a very enjoyable time with racing and car in general, and uh, whether it was Camaros at Daytona 24 Hours or Porsches at Daytona, Sebring, Watkins Glen 6 Hour, whatever, all that has been fabulous, but today with so much private coaching that I do for people at driver education events, for people who want to become better racers, I, I really love teaching. And I look forward to that every time. I mean, we're, we're going to Road Atlanta this weekend, and I have five different people that I'll be teaching at Road Atlanta this weekend. It's going to be a blast. Wow, so that, that's awesome. And, and what a tribute to your dad, too, because as he got involved in racing and sort of inspired you, I think is what I'm hearing, um, to, to, to get you involved. And, and he was quite accomplished as well. You mentioned that he raced uh, the 356 Porsche. So our very first Porsche night that we had here, we had another local guy, John Reeker, bring on his uh, 64 or 65 uh, Cabriolet. And we talked about the evolution of Porsche and the four-cylinder Porsche all the way to current time. You know, it's sort of where it started with Porsche and then all the way up now to the 718 and, you know, the turbocharged four-cylinder cars. So we had a really neat conversation about that, but when you think about your dad driving a 356, I know you mentioned to me earlier kind of a neat story that he found a car that had been wrecked and he took it in, redid the car, put it on you know, put it on the racetrack and never looked back to any other kind of car other than a Porsche from that point. Is that right? That is correct. Once once he spent the time fixing the Porsche from the accident, um, 
and it, it was a speedster, 57 speedster, had been damaged front and back. And when he did the repairs, he looked at the engineering of the Porsche, and it was so superior from the British cars. He said he'd never have another British car, and he never did. All right, and uh, one of the one of the few times I was able to race with my father was at West Palm Beach International Raceway in 1976. So I am about two years into racing, and my dad had started in 1959. So I drove Saturday's racing, reset the track record Saturday, and was just all full of myself, right? Well, Sunday's race, my dad beats my new track record, put me in my place, and uh, it's one of those memories I'll never forget. I was I had a great time racing with my dad. Well, that's awesome. You know, um, I, I was involved in racing, as I mentioned to you earlier, not as a not as a driver, but as a crewman back in the '80s in IMSA. Um, yeah, that was the big time. Uh, yeah, the Camel GT IMSA series with the uh, Porsche 962. Uh, was very fortunate to be involved with some of the people that I was involved with, and just had a blast. And uh, you know, my passion for Porsche is you know is, is been from a very young boy all the way through there, and that was just you know a, a big time for me to be involved in that. But when we think about uh, that time in Porsche and all the excitement about Porsche in the 80s in terms of racing, they were. It was amazing with the 962, um, just a, you know, an amazing winning streak. But when you think about the earlier days and what your dad did with the Sports Car Club of America back then to sort of put clubs together and to really sort of get people excited about driving the cars and whatnot, and all that he accomplished in his time racing cars and helping people that not long before he passed away, he was inducted into the SCCA Hall of Fame. So I looked at that, I was looking at it here during the last week, sort of preparing to have the conversation with you. And for people who aren't familiar with the Sports Car Club of America, this is a very um, storied organization, really started sports car racing uh, for a lot of people uh, in this country. And for people in racing, or people who follow racing, you've probably heard the name Roger Penske. Probably anybody who's heard anything about car racing anywhere around the world knows Roger Penske. Well, Roger Penske was also an inductee into the Sports Car Club of America. So your dad is in some pretty amazing company. I know he didn't achieve all the things that Roger Penske did, but he did achieve quite a lot with the Sports Car Club, and I was reading a little bit about that. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things he did for the club and what really helped to get him inducted into the club? Well, I, I'm not certain that there was a position with the local club that he didn't hold, much less the divisional ranks. And of course, in the national level, he was a competition director for more than 10 years for SCCA. So uh, basically, he was running the board that tried to keep all of the cars in parity, class to class to class. At that time, 27 classes, and now more. And uh, so he had, he had quite the task. And there was constantly manufacturers trying to put him in a position where they might get a favor or something. And he never, he never did anything with him. He just was focused on doing what was right for the club racer. That's how he started racing. He wanted all the guys who worked hard all week long and then went to the track in the weekend. But they got a fair shake every time they went to the track. And he was very focused on that. Okay? And Roger Penske started as a driver up in the northeast, okay? And then incorporately, he was no longer really allowed to drive, but Roger was quite the thing. He was a very good driver. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I read something about he was involved with spec racing. So he actually was at the forefront of actually creating a spec racer in SCCA. So what that means is that in SCCA racing, typically you had people racing the cars that you know on the street, the, the Porsche 356, or what have you. Spec Racer now took it to a different level. Well, now it was a purpose-built race car, right? It, it had maybe a power plant out of, you know, whatever manufacturer, but this was a purpose-built spec race car. So he was at the forefront of that. Well, 
not only was in the forefront, he was pushing the ball. And originally it was designed by Renault. And I know Renault had spent about $10 million on designing this car. I don't know if that's because the French like to work at things like that, but it was a lot of money. They built a, a pretty safe car, and um, there were a number of customer service representatives around the country, and that's where you would have the work done on the cars, and these guys, my dad was one of them, were required to have a presence at the local races to help support that spec car. Now, today it's powered by Ford, and Roush Racing was involved with changing over the, the drivetrain to Ford, and there have been minor changes along the way, but the chassis is still the basic package. You could buy, and I think today still, you can buy a kit from SCCA Enterprises, build your race car, and go racing in SCCA in a spec series. So pretty cool to think that your dad was, you know, helped to create all that, helped to create the interest in it, um, everything about it to bring it, and it's still alive today. SCCA uh, Club ra um, Spec Racing is still very much alive today, uh, so that, that's a, a pretty cool honor. I have to tell a little personal story about your dad. I know I've mentioned it to you before, but I came to know your dad as I was uh, embarking on uh, a project with my 914 that I purchased back in 1983, and I was going to go ahead and convert it to what's called a six-cylinder 914. So, and I still own it today, and uh, so I, I found an engine uh, from a guy who told me it was a 911S. He told me it was a 911S engine that had just been rebuilt. So I, I, I had him bring the car, bring all the parts and the engine over to Zot's garage at the time, where your dad was doing engines in the back. And so we had a look at the engine, and I decided to let him, you know, do a rebuild to it. And when we tore it all apart, it wasn't an S engine, but it was an original 914.6 case engine. So I thought, okay, well, this is pretty cool. You know, what better guy to, to rebuild it? So, you know, he did it for me. It wasn't an elaborate build. It was a very simple, straightforward build. But I got to know your dad over the course of several months. And uh, he was just the kindest guy. You know, um, loved talking about his work. Loved talking about the family business. Um, you know, loved talking about you guys and all, all that you did in your racing. So I, I guess I was uh, pretty honored to know your dad. And I know it wasn't, it wasn't but a few years later that he that he passed away but kind of kind of cool story he was never quite sure how I took racing which he spent most of his life working putting money aside so that he could race and watched me turn racing into a business and he just constantly was shaking his head I have no idea how you did that you, you did good son you did good <laughs> It was awesome. Well, let's talk about that now. So, um, Ron was kind enough to bring in, you know, a car that uh, he helps to maintain and prepare for, I guess this is a customer car. Okay. Uh, this is a really cool car here. This is a, a Cayman GT4 Club Sport. So, I'm going to let you tell the folks a little bit about club this, this particular car uh, and what type of racing it's involved in and uh, how you're involved. And, and um, so, let's just dive in there. Well, this particular car, uh, most people will recognize if you talk about a cup car, and not thinking about Winston Cup, but thinking about Porsche and cup cars, you're generally thinking about a GT3 Cup, either a 996, 997, or 991 currently. And then in 2016, Porsche came out with this model, which is a Cayman GT4 Club Sport. They also built an MR, which is, it was a Matheny Racing version. So Porsche would build the Club Sport, take it to Matheny, Matheny would make a few changes, lighten it up a little bit. This car, is being a Club Sport, has power windows, power mirrors, AC and heat, air jacks, 
has a fuel cell. It's a street engine, okay, 3.8 liter, and um, PDK transmission. And this car, this particular package, was intended for Porsche Club racing with gentlemen drivers and only them on the track. So there's a series with GT4 Club Sports that ran and still do with Porsche Club Racing where it's just those guys. Now, this year they kind of added some entry to that. There was a reason. They only made 20 of these. They made 20 of the pro version, the MR, and those went pro racing with the Continental Series or Pirelli World Challenge. These cars, for the most part, stayed in Porsche Club Racing. Now, you'll see them in other places, but not in numbers. So, you'll see them at driver education events where people are training and getting ready to go racing, but mostly you would see between 10 and 15 of them racing together at a track and all amongst themselves, so there wasn't a lot of other higher speed or slower speed cars, and that's what those guys really kind of wanted. So, the frame in the car, it has a, a full roll cage in it that is done at the factory, and um, so when it left the factory, it's just like a cup car, except it's a Cayman version of a cup car. So it will always have a pretty strong value. This car ran as in the secondary market, not primary. Primary, you would buy them for about 200, a little over $200,000. This car was 185,000. It had very little time on it and no damage. And as you can see, a very colorful uh, wrap on the car. But um, it's a wonderful car. They're uh, relatively easy to drive uh, compared to a cup car. So let's say you were driving a street car or a lower horsepower Porsche race car, and you really didn't want to jump into the maintenance cost or the initial, you know, what you're dealing with a cup car, there's a lot of maintenance that goes on. Okay? You wanted something lower maintenance. This was an opportunity that came out in the 2016. We anticipate in the next couple of years that they're going to come out with a second version of it. Nothing's in writing yet, but we know that this car no longer is really competitive in the professional world because uh, Camaros have stepped up the power and some of the other cars, they've stepped up the power where these, these are having trouble. So in Pirelli World Challenge or Continental, it's tough for this car to maintain a competitive edge. So Porsche will come out with the next version, probably with a four liter, maybe another 50 horsepower or more, that'll bump it back into the top of the competitive market. Wow. So for people who are just Porsche fans, right? Maybe they, they've never owned a Porsche. Maybe they've come to a track and seen a Porsche. Maybe they've been to the local dealer and seen a Porsche. This is essentially a Porsche Cayman. Okay, this is a mid-engine um, car. Great handling car, but this is essentially could be a street car. Now, at the factory, they've, they've done some things to it, but really, the, you know, when you look at the difference, as you said, the engine is pretty much the, the same engine that, that you'd buy in a, a GT, GT4 street car. So this is something, again, that when you're dealing with Porsche, and we've talked about it on previous shows, the engineering that Porsche puts into their cars for the street, a lot of that same engineering is right in the cars that they that are at the track. So they always want to be at the forefront of that, and they always want to give, whether it be the gentleman driver, the professional driver, or just the regular person who's looking to have a great car to drive around, a lot of fun, a big thrill, and uh, it's all it's all here in the same package, you know. So you can you can sort of get the same shape, you sort of get the same idea uh, about the car, whether it be on the racetrack or whether it be here. So pretty cool stuff. Um, tell us a little bit though about your business. So you said your dad is amazed. He was amazed that you were actually making a living doing this. You weren't. Most guys who go racing, unless they're you know have more money than than they know what to do with, they you know they, they don't make a living out of it. So how have you managed to make a living out of it? And, and just tell us a little bit about your business here locally. I know you're up near Edgewater, right? You've got a big shop up there. So maybe you can tell folks about uh, what Zots Racing does. Well, 
that's that's a good question. Let's um, let's talk about it some. So Zots Racing is not this three, four hundred people little business. It's a family business. It's always been a family business. So when I started involved with racing, it was the hobby. It wasn't the business. But the name Zots Racing started January 5th, 1960. Okay? And the name was pulled from a book that was written in the 50s and a movie that was also by the same name. And, um, you know, so... If you ever get a chance to read the book or watch the movie, they're, they're very interesting. So what's the name of the book or the movie? Zots. It's just Zots. And, okay, so we so that's going to be, so it's going to be a big tease. We don't know anything about the movie. What's it about? We just got to go check it out. It's, it's a sci-fi comedy is what it is. It really is. Okay, so combine sci-fi economy with German sports car engineering, and we got Zots Racing. Awesome. Okay. Well, somewhere in the book and in the movie, um, the lead character gets it's zapped with the power of Zots, okay? And this power is released through his hand, okay? So in the 60s, my dad and these guys, they see this movie and they go, ah, this is going to be awesome. We're going to go to the race, to the false grid, and we will Zots all of the competition, and we will win all of the races, okay? So in our logo, which is the shape of a Porsche emblem, is a hand, which is connected to the story of Zotz. Okay. Right, so now I have the rest of the story. I, I get it now. I, I, I wanted to ask you about it. I'm glad that it came out, where, how the name came about. So that's great. Went from, from that story to a business was, um, you know, I wanted to be involved with racing because I grew up in it. Well, at one point, I ended up running the family street shop for many, many years, never actually wanting to. Met a lot of great people. You know, we had maybe 3,500 different clients, some great families that you would work on a car that went from dad to mom to son to daughter to the next son and so on, some of the Volvos and whatever. And, and uh, it was always really, you got to know a family and it was, it was cool, all right? But it wasn't my passion. My passion has been, and as far as I know, until I pass, that's going to be cars and racing and Porsches. So somewhere in the late 80s, I started working for some clients that wanted me to teach them to drive and prepare their race cars. They didn't want to trailer it. They didn't want to work on it. They just wanted to arrive, have fun, and go home. And one at a time, this became, actually, it kind of got in the way of the street business. Because it was growing so fast that we actually ended up having to move the racing away from the street shop. Okay? And uh, then once we did that, I thought, well, this is too much space. Not an, We don't have enough clients to support this space. And within six months, we didn't have enough space again. So um, it, it just kept growing, and the idea of the arrive and drive is it's the bread and butter of what we do. So there are plenty of, of guys and gals out there that are very successful at what they do, and they, they don't want to have to learn another career on how to properly prepare a car for use on the racetrack for whatever reason, for a driver education event, for just track time, for autocrossing, for racing, for professional racing, it doesn't matter. If it's a portion that goes to the track, that fit our billy rig. That's what we wanted to do. And uh, so we did that, of course, and that was successful until the economy slowed things down in 2007, 8, and so on. And then we picked back up Zotz Auto Works, working on the streetcars. Okay? Now the economy is doing better. The shop is packed with 55 some odd race cars in there, and it's amazing. Every time you walk in the shop in the morning, you see all those cars, you go, 
boom, boom, boom. That's awesome. Like, how am I still here? How am I? How am I still here? Following my passion, you know, having a blast. And it's still family because now uh, we have third generation is my son who's racing and working on the cars and building engines. You know, my son started working at the shop. I remember we were going to go to a Road America to a historic event at Road America, and he says, Dad. I want to go on the trip, but I want to work this time, okay? So sure enough, he did, and then that summer, he started things like, he took a 914 apart, stripped it completely apart at 14, okay? So when I was 14, I was building race engines for my dad. He's at 14, he's ripping cars apart. It's, it was pretty crazy, and now well, I have a grandson, William, and um, he's often laying underneath the car with Eric, and he'll be holding wrenches trying to help his dad, and he's three and a half. Yeah, so I don't think the chain is gonna be broken anytime soon. I think it's alive and well, and you don't, you don't have anything to be concerned about. So yeah, I know you touched on it briefly earlier, but for folks in the, Day in the uh, Central Florida area, especially with Daytona being right up the road from us, the Rolex 24 is a big deal, right? Uh, it used to be called the 24 Hours of Daytona and the Daytona Continental before that. But so you've competed in the in the Rolex 24 as it's known today quite a few times. So what is maybe the most memorable time or the most exciting time that you had at the 24 Hours of Daytona? Well, I'll give you a couple of them. The first one, I was actually working as a crew chief for my dad and my brother. Okay? And uh, they were running a 911 that belonged to Air Dubay, who's passed away. The Air lived in, in Holly Hill, next to Daytona. And um, so that was GTU back then. So it would have been a two liter 911. And it was one of those times that I realized I was just more driven than the average bear. So the car would come in, there'd be something wrong with it, and I, I just wouldn't give up. I, okay, we've got to find this problem, we've solved the problem, get the car back out on the track. And then it's probably two o'clock in the morning, my dad's in a lawn chair sleeping, the car comes in and it's a knock, 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 and everybody's like, ah, oh, we're out, okay? So I get underneath and I'm, and we'd already changed the engine and transmission. Okay, that, that was a rough year, okay? So we had actually taken a soft zip out rear window 911S with a fresh rebuild. One of the guys on the crew, Bob Mabry, he backed the car up to the pits. You can't do that anymore, but we did that. And the car came in, had a bad, bad motor problem. So we pulled the drivetrain. We have a team of guys pull the drivetrain out of the car on pit lane during the 24 hours, and a, a team of guys pulling the drivetrain out of the street 911S Targa, okay, zip out rear window, maybe two or three hundred of those made, and we pull the drivetrain across, stick it into the car in pit lane, go back out, and the corner workers were calling the car the two liter turbo because you couldn't hear it anymore, and we left the sock muffler on it. So, <laughs> So this was in the 80s? This was in the 80s? 70s, late 70s. 1976, 1976. So then my other super favorite Daytona was when I won the race in class in 2000, driving a Camaro Trans Am car. Oh my gosh, so you, you, all these years with Porsche and then you got your you got your win in a Camaro. But you know what, that just, that just shows you right there that you're a racer to the core and you want to win and if it meant in a Camaro, then it meant in a Camaro. So, all right, well, you know, I'll tell you what, it's been a, a lot of fun speaking to you tonight. Uh, we can't thank you enough for, you know, sharing this car with us. Uh, I know it takes quite a bit to get to, to bring a car out and, and to put it on set for us, and, you know, we're battling some rain tonight and so forth, but really happy that you uh, you did that for us. Uh, so much fun, you know, talking some stories about your dad and, and the history of the family business. I mean, who doesn't want to support a family business? Who doesn't want to support a local business? And uh, certainly, you know, you've got all of the, uh, the experience and the wherewithal to be able to help anybody who wants to get involved in racing a Porsche. So, again, Ron, thanks so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking to you tonight. Thank you very much. Right. It's been great. All right. We're going to invite Nick Wong in to come in and, and talk to us about uh, about his car. Yeah, come right on. Uh, come right on this way, Nick. So it's great to see you. Yeah, come on in. Now uh, let's have a seat and, and talk about your car. So. 
2008 Porsche GT2. Yes. So anytime you have Porsche and GT together in the same sentence, it gets people's attention, right? Uh, I think we have a couple of the, the brothers of this car in the lot tonight. Always neat to see some GT cars uh, coming in here. So unlike uh, Charles, when he was talking to us about his Porsche ownership, sort of the beginning of his Porsche passion, um, when we spoke the other day, you told me that this is your first Porsche. And there's something about GT cars and first Porsches. We had a guy on uh, two shows ago by the name of Mike Collins. He's the former drummer for Wham back in, back in the 80s. And he had a, a beautiful uh, GT3 car. And it was his first Porsche as well. So I thought it was pretty interesting when we spoke the other day um, that this is your first Porsche. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you... You to get um, interested in Porsche, you, you own some other cars. What was it that really got your attention and you said, hey, you know, I want to get involved uh, with a Porsche? Well, strictly speaking, uh, I came down to, we wanted to compete in One Night in America in 2011, uh, actually 2012. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to competitive all big dogs. Uh, we competed previously with a 1992 uh, Nissan Sound GTR, which was also mine, but we had broken down now. So this time around, we wanted to have something that had a little more open, a little bit more of the speed of his And I knew that Lee Keen and the guys who were top speed in uh, Atlanta had been running a GT2, a 996 GT2, for uh, very successfully for a couple of years. So I said, why don't we help the ante a little, go with the 997 GT2, and uh, see how it goes from there. Wow, so that was really it. It was all about the one lap race. So for folks that maybe aren't familiar with the one lap of America race, I mean, I don't know, maybe um, people associate that with the cannonball run Absolutely. kind of thing, right? Absolutely. So maybe, you know, uh, tell everyone watching and out here tonight a little bit more about the one lap race and what that's all about. Uh, the one lap race is uh, a race that originally started by the uh, cannonball game, the CS96 Trophy, which was basically you know, driving from LA to New York, you could do it the least amount of time possible. Obviously, as the years went by, it became less and less uh, feasible to do a race like that. So what they did, they changed the format. They said, let's do it over in one week's time, but we'll go to a different track every day. And uh, sometimes uh, you would go from one track to another track uh, one day, and it would be maybe 50 to 100 miles. And then overnight, you might have to do 1,000 miles to get to another track. So these cars had to be you know, good street cars to begin with. And then they also had to perform on the track, too. You had to do it on street tires. And uh, they would be different formats. Like one day, you might have a skid pad test. The other day, you might have a bracket racing test. GT2s and GT2 RS of that era had very weak uh, wheels for this. So you had 
very low preloads, and they, they would activate promptly with their push packs. So you could really do wonders even just with a disc fish. So, so you get the car and you say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and do all these modifications. So how did you uh, determine who it was that was going to do all these modifications for you? And uh, who did it end up being? Well, I broke it down to two different things. One of them was, we're only going to get a car. And then, based on where I was going to get the car, geographically, who was the best group to do it with. And what ended up happening was that the company that helped me get the car ended up building the car for me. And that was Champion Racing. Okay, so down in Pompano Beach? Yes. Um, Champion Racing, uh, a good friend of mine, worked on their Audi uh, racing team. That, you know, they had tremendous success with Audi. And so I'm very familiar with this group. I lived in uh, Fort Lauderdale area from, I think it was about uh, 1987 to 2004. So I'm very familiar with Champion. They do have a, a tremendous facility down there. A lot of, uh, they do a lot of development stuff. Make a lot of their own bits and pieces. So I know when you shared with me the link the other day, I was able to go ahead and take a look at uh, all the things that were done. And boy, it, it was it was really impressive. Um, so work, a lot of detail, all the components that were used. If you go ahead and turn this into the car that uh, that you wanted it to turn into, talk about that process a little bit. Um, how long did this take? Um, how much involvement did you have? Did you have to visit the car quite a bit during the process? So on and so forth. Well, we got the car in, I would say, March of 2011, and we immediately started working on the car. Um, I wasn't around for the initial work. What we did was, I said, I want to make sure the car wouldn't be able to drive. You know, it's typical widow-maker problem that we were always worried about. So, the number one thing is make it stay out of the drive because I never heard of Thank you. 
if you were to use the horsepower of the wheels on C16, which is give or take about 950. Wow, so when you talk about a car for the street, <laughs> uh, with 900 horsepower, uh, things start to get out of hand. Things start to get a little crazy, right? Because you know, what, what can you do with that car on the street? So, uh, amazing figures. The folks down at Champion sound like they did an awesome job for you. It sounds like you really couldn't have been much happier with what they did for you. Um, and, you know, the end result is uh, what we see here. I know we've been trying to flash some pictures of the process up uh, on the broadcast here so people can sort of get a little bit of a view into what was done down there. I know Champion, I think, did a great job for their customers at highlighting all of these upgrades and, and their process. That was pretty cool. I really appreciate you sharing those links with me the other day so we could, we could get a little air time on that. That's so what was the end result? So you got the car all taken care of, so what happened uh, when, you, when it came time to, 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 to go for it? Uh, life intervened, you know? Uh, a lot of things happened uh, between there and now. We, uh, we decided to move from Chicago down to Florida, and then uh, we got children, and uh, we have been kind of on hiatus. So the car is basically a street car now, but it, you know, I drive it away exactly the way we had it set up initially, Any 
Porsche has been engineered with sport in mind, uh, with performance in mind. You can always count on Porsche engineering uh, to put a smile on your face and to, and to give your car the going to be reliable, it's going to perform, and do just what you said, whether it be on the track, whether it be on the street, it's going to be there for you, and it's going to, it's going to perform and be reliable. So, uh, as we finish up the conversation, so thanks so much for coming in. I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you sharing the car. It's not too often ever uh, that we have the opportunity uh, out here on this show to talk about a car like this. Not many of these exist at all. Not many GT2s, period, were built, and certainly not one that's had the modifications and all of the, all of the uh, upgrades that you've done to the car. So it's a real treat for us. So we really appreciate you bringing it in. Um, Several episodes ago, we talked a little bit about Porsche, and the folks at Porsche of Orlando were kind enough to bring cars out to us in the past. We talked about electric technology, e-hybrid technology, the new Porsche Mission E technology, which is all electric, so an all-electric sports car. Um, and then recently, Porsche has talked about you know, um, you know, coming out with more variations of the electric car. E-Mission. E-Mission. You know, all of uh, the Mission E. On that, so you're all about performance and high horsepower. Um, maybe before we get to that, the car that's just out here uh, to uh, my left is a brand new 2018 Porsche uh, Panamera e hybrid. And this car, I was speaking to Teddy, uh, the salesperson from uh, the brand ambassador from uh, Porsche Orlando, he brought the car over to us. He said, This car in stock trim is 680. This is a four-door sedan, right? The car that so many people, maybe some of the, what we call a Porsche purist, you know, sort of scoffed at when Porsche said, hey, we're going to come out with a four-door sedan, or when they started to come out with a Porsche Cayenne, they said, you know, what are these cars? But now we have a four-door sedan with 680 horsepower at performance levels with technology, with e-hybrid, with electric, that is just, it's astounding, it's amazing. Your perspective on e-hybrid and electric technology being, you know, sort of the pure sports car guy. How, how do you look at all that? I, 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 I make my choices from an engineer perspective. So if I have to engineer the car, I want it to be simple. The hybrid technology is not simple. So you're adding, you know, you got add your right, internal combustion engine. They're taking the 919 to tracks all around. 
around the world to try to break and shatter, you know, um, all, the, all the F1 records that all are some of the greatest tracks that they've already done at Spa Front for Shops, uh, just, I think, last week. Yes. So, pretty exciting thing. Yes. So, well, cool. Well, thanks for sharing that perspective. You know, from one car guy to another, I'm always curious what people are, are thinking about uh, the, the electric technology e hybrid. So, so, again, I want to thank you for bringing the car in. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, Okay, all right. How about that? A great job, huh? You know, it keeps us up. He's also going to take over Sean's spot on Cycle Fever TV. <laughs>